Good morning. None. None. Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. We are talking in the day. Pretty weather's got us talking. We are glad that you have uh, chosen to be in worship here this morning. Um, we, we invite you here, welcome you here, glad you're here. Um, hopefully you received an order of worship on your way in. There's a lot inside this, and I will try to go through it as quickly as possible. Um, if you've been here for the past two weeks, you probably can recite back to me everything I'm going to say. But um, So I just want to kind of go through this. If you look on the front of the order of worship, you'll see who we are, what we do. We're Grace United Methodist Church. We believe it is our mission and our calling from Jesus to make disciples. Each and every one of us have that responsibility. We believe as a church we can best make disciples through the areas of worship, missions, Christian education, and youth and children's ministries. If you open up your order of worship, you will see things going on in the life of the church this week on this week's calendar. Uh, please take note of, of that. If you open the order of worship all the way up, you will see the order of what we'll be doing today. You'll also see um, a few announcements. I do want to touch um, on a few of those announcements. The first is a big thank you. Um, last Sunday, immediately following worship, we had a committee set-up meeting, and a lot of the uh, folks who were there helped in preparing food. Uh, the men and the women helped with making soup and sandwiches and making sure we had everything we needed. So if you helped with um, that, that meal last Sunday right after church, we, I thank you for, for doing that. Uh, please take note next Sunday, immediately following worship on January the 25th, um, Grace on Wheels will be running after worship. Grace on Wheels is a mission of the church that goes and provides food for those in the community who are um, less fortunate than we are. And so we go into the community, provide food. Um, we would um, love for you to be a part of this ministry, this mission. Um, please also take note of the adults night out that are going to uh, Lakeside Grill on Thursday, January the 22nd. If you're interested, please see Janice Hawthorne, um, talk with her about this trip. Um, inside, there's a bunch of stuff stuffed in, in your order of worship. I do want to touch on that for just very briefly. Um, the first is if you are a uh, first-time guest with us, you'll see a single card. Um, if you are a first-time guest or second-time guest, please put your information on here. Our ushers will be standing in the back after the worship service. They will have baskets. You can put these cards in the basket. Um, we just want to stay in touch with you. If you are first, second-time guest or been here a while, if you put on the back, there's an opportunity to uh, share with us the church so that we can um, walk with you on your journey of faith. If you take a next step today, if you decide to move forward, whether it be in relationship with God or maybe something in the service challenges you to step um, uh, up in your relationship with God, please include that. We would love to hear about your next step. Um, also, you will see a 2015 budget for Grace United Methodist Church. Um, we have been including this in the order of worship for this whole month of January so that we are as transparent as can be for the ministries and missions of the church for this upcoming year. Um, this also reminds us that it, it takes money to do ministry and missions in the church, and we are partners in providing the funds and, and resources to make sure that we as a church are able to do everything we believe God has called us to do. All right? So we're partners in sharing resources to make this happen. And in being partners, um, you'll see an envelope that has... Uh, no address other than the return address for the church. You will see a piece of paper that has a hashed or dashed line in the center. And just as, as plain as, as I can be, if you have not already filled one, one of these out, I invite you to do that today. Um, the reason we need you to do this is, is because it exhibits your commitment to give to the church. But it's more than just giving to the church. It's about your uh, commitment with God and your relationship with God. God calls his people to give. Um, and so, if you will, if you have not already, take a moment today to fill out this information. You put the same thing on both sheets of paper, you'll tear it in half, you put one in the envelope, seal the envelope, put your mailing address on the front of the envelope so that we can mail it back to you um, halfway through the year. You will also receive a given statement up to that point, and you will be able to compare the two and say, hey, I've either given where I said I would give or I haven't. Um, and then you keep the other half, you keep it with you to be a reminder to you of how much you, how much you have committed to give to the church for the uh, ministry support and mission support of the church. So if you have not done this already, please do that today. And then as the offering plate comes by, you can drop your envelope that is sealed with your paper in there and with your mailing address on there, put it in the offering plate, and that will be collected after the service. 
and we will not open those because what you give and your commitment to give is between you and God. It's not any of our business. So it will be mailed back to you as the same way that you've put it into the offering plate. I think that's everything. Shoo. All right. I invite you to stand as we join together in worship this morning. to you this morning rejoicing that you are God. We ask forgiveness of our sins. We ask a lot of you the things that are matters on our mind. We ask for comfort and peace and healing. We ask for reasons to glorify you. We thank you we have the opportunity to gather here today to worship in song and in prayer and in the word that we hear from Jason. Father, we pray that you would wrap Jason in the Holy Spirit, flood him in such a way with your word that you hide him behind the cross, that as he brings the word to us, it reaches each and every one of us just as you would have it do. Be with us now as we pray the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The lion is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. up. We're not going to do the Apostles' Creed just yet. I'm going to invite Bill if you'll come and share um, testimony and witness.
fly on solo. <laughs> I thought I had another minute or two to get my head straight here. Um, Susan's not with me today. It's supposed to be Susan and I up here talking. Um, Jason sent an email six, eight weeks ago for us asking us if we would do this, and mysteriously the youth retreat happened to be the same weekend. Funny how that worked out for her, but um, here I am. And as um, I was looking at the email, I, I began praying about Jason's email as soon as I got it. My prayers went something like, Lord, please give me a legitimate excuse to get out of this. Please show me something that I can say that will make sense so that I can get out of this. But um, while I was praying for an excuse, what I was led to was four points. Um, so instead of an excuse, I'm gonna try to cover four points before I faint. Um, the first words that come to mind is, um, Bill, do you trust God? Do you really trust God? Sure, I pray. Every concern I have, I take to God. Um, do you take your checkbook to God, Bill? Every month, you get to look at those bills. You get to look at what's due. Do you give your first 10%? Do you take your month and say, here's my month, God. It's in your hands. Do I do that? I would love to stand up here and tell you for the last 15 years I've done that every month. That'd be a total lie. I can't do that. Um, I will say I'm very proud to admit to more times than not over the last four, five, six years on a monthly basis, Susan and I have made that choice. Um, and it's a benefit. Miracles do happen. You guys have heard over the last few weeks different people talking about um, even though the math doesn't make sense, give your 10% right from the beginning. Miracles will happen. You will, your money will, will stretch. You will get through the month. Um, I'm here to tell you again, those miracles do happen. But not always will that money fall from the sky like manna in the desert. Um, you may not see it as a blessing when it comes. It may be a little extra overtime. It might be a side job that you can pick up to make the ends meet where they don't meet. It might be extra money in the mail. Um, it might be that um, the power company is willing to give you 15 extra days to, to make that payment. In any case, it's a blessing. Um, but then I got to thinking, my third point is, why are we really doing this? Do I? Do I write this check every month anticipating a miracle from God? Do I do it just to watch him dance? Um, no, absolutely not. Um, actually, the biggest miracle that I can think of in my financial life, if God would lead me to um, living within my means every month beyond writing that first check, let me take that other 90 and try to live the way you want me to do with that 90. So we're not supposed to be writing that check in anticipation of some blessing. Um, this goes back to, um, I was born and raised in a Marines household. Um, it's the right thing to do, Bill. And when I was living under that household, it was followed with, and you will do it. Um, I love my dad to the bottom of my toes and never once has he told me, and you will do it, and it not been something good for me. Our Heavenly Father has told us what we're supposed to do. And why? It's the right thing to do. He told us to do it. And in my opinion, that should be the reason we do it. It's the right thing to do. Um, enough reason. The reasons to live your life. It's the right thing to do. Um, Susan and I talked about this a good bit, and um, she did have some words she wanted to um, to add to what was going to what we were saying. And um, if any of you guys are on social media, you know she is um, quite the devotion reader and quite the devotion sharer um, on the social media. So um, she gave me a, a quote from one of her um, devotions, and it's based upon Second Corinthians <coughs> chapter nine, verse seven. 
everyone must make up his own mind as to how much he should give. Don't force anyone to give more than they really want to, for cheerful givers are the ones God prizes. And Mary Sutherland is the author who had this take on that scripture. We make a living by what we get out of life. We make a life out of what we give and how we give it. I'm convinced that God loves to see us give for no other reason than the joy of giving. Um, God really doesn't need your money. What God needs is for us, me, you, to submit to him in our life, in our thoughts, in our prayers, and in our finances. Let him lead that part of your life. Um, it's the right thing to do. I got one sentence in closing, or actually two sentences in closing. God loves us even when we're not faithful, but faithful Christians tithe. Faithful, Christ faithful Christians tithe with a cheerful heart, knowing that we have, at least for that moment we have, done the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. If you will, let's stand together in affirming our faith the Apostles' Creed. We do this every week to remind ourselves the essential truths of the Christian faith. That When you say, I am Christian, these are the very basics um, that define being Christian. Let us join together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you're up, take a moment, greet those around you, welcome them, welcome them to grace. Welcome to grace. This one's scary. It is. Okay, well. <laughs> And before we start this next song, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have a couple of um, younger ones up here. Y'all are talkative this morning. Wow, that's good to see. <laughs> but we've got a couple of younger ones up here. And God, he, he loves all kind of music. And he loves music from the young to the old. So it's just so encouraging to see the younger ones up here and how excited they get to sing up here. So um, just remember that as we sing this next song. It's called 10,000 Reasons.
Let us continue worshiping God with God's tithe and our offering as we have this opportunity and privilege to give back to God a portion of what is already God's, God's tithe and our offering. Let us pray together. Gracious and almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity to give. God, as we have already heard this morning, Lord, it is an opportunity for us to trust you. Lord, for, for us to take you at your word, it's your invitation to all people to give a tithe, your tithe. And Lord, then watch what you will do. God, not only how you will return um, blessing upon us, but God, how you will take that small amount and you will make amazing things happen through the life of your church. So Holy Spirit, we pray that everything that is given and received today in this place will be blessed and multiplied by you so that more people will come to know of the good news of Jesus Christ because of how Grace United Methodist Church gives. Lord, may we remember this truth because you are the giver of all good gifts. But God, we are never more like you than when we are giving. Lord, we pray, pray this in your holy and mighty name. Amen. This is the moment. It's on the line. Which way you're gonna It's an open door, and it's your life, yeah, it's your life. Are you who you always said you would be, with a sinking feeling in your chest? Are you always waiting on someone else? you are and who your heart beats for. It's an open door to live the way that you believe. This is your opportunity to let your life be one that lights the way. It's your life, what you're gonna do. The world is watching you every day, the choices you make. Say what you are and who your heart beats for. It's an open door. And it's your life, what you're gonna do. The world is watching you every day. The choices you make. Say what you are and who your heart beats for. It's an open door.
And if you could please stand as we present God's tithes and our offerings. may be seated and children may be dismissed for children's church at this time. Good morning. This morning I'm going to be reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in Philippi. And he, would, he wrote this letter to thank them for a gift that they had sent him and also to encourage them in their faith. And this is Philippians second chapter verses 13 or 12 and 13. And this is called Shining as Lights in the World. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, the past couple weeks we've been in a sermon series entitled Focus. And the whole point of it is for us at the church to, to begin to think, to, to evaluate, to, to take into consideration, um, to refocus our lives as a church in, in what God calls us to do. And we began um, a couple of weeks ago thinking, you know, out of all the, the, the groups and folks in the world, the one thing that distinguishes the church from any other group is that we worship God. And so we, we, began, we began at this thought, this idea that we, we need to start at, at the very beginning. We worship. And then last week we talked about, you know what, if we're going to worship God and we're going to take serious this, this mission that God gives the church to go and make disciples, the step, one of the biggest steps to that is making sure we have an open door for people who are wanting to turn to God, that we don't live our life and act in such a way that the doors just slam shut, the doors open for all people. And so today we're moving from um, connecting, from worshiping and connecting last week to today that if we're going to have an open door for all people as a church, that means for us that we have to go deep. And that's, so that's, that, that's, that's our title today, that we're going deep. And your takeaway point is that going deep requires our decision, our commitment, and no excuses. Do you hear me? It requires our decision, our commitment, and no excuses. So to get us started, this past week, Something happened that has never happened. The college football playoff. The championship game. And some of you are thinking, oh boy, here we go. And if you don't care about football, just hang with me because I'm, I'm, I'm convinced it will come all together in the point that we're going to be making today. So as I'm sitting there watching this game between Ohio, I mean, yeah, Ohio State and Oregon, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking... Man, this is, this is it. This is great. And if you watched the game, then you probably picked up on there were a bunch of fumbles between both teams. Just dropping the ball. The turnovers, you know, dropping the ball. Fumbles over and over and over. And then I'm sitting there watching and watching the fumbles, watching them drop the ball. I have this amazing thought. It, it'll go right in line with the sermon. But just to back up my theory, I grab my phone, pull up the email, and shoot an email to Coach Nick. And it went something like this. So, Coach, here's my question for you. This, this was in the email. Is it a safe statement that with the sloppiness of this ball game, especially with the fumbles and dropping the ball, is it a safe statement that's a surefire way for a team to self-destruct? I thought, this, this is clever. And I'm saying, you know, Coach, because it, it, if, if you can help me out with this, 
it's, it's going to be great for the sermon. And the reason I thought that is because this whole idea of, of dropping the ball, that's a tension that we as a church have too. We can get folks in the door, but if we're not careful, we'll drop the ball. And we just get them in the door and they're left thinking, what's next? We don't go deeper. So, I'm waiting on coach to get the email back to me. I get up the next morning, still no email, and all of a sudden my phone goes, king. I'm like, all right. And what I'm expecting from Coach Nick is for him to say, Jason, that is profound. That, that's, that's, that is great. You're on to something here. But that's not what he said. At all. He answered my question. He said, yeah. That if, if you... And if a team who consistently drops the ball, they can self-destruct, he just said, yeah. I'm like, all right, appreciate it. But then he went on, and he gave me information that I did not ask for. And after reading it, I'm thinking, I'm glad you gave me information that I did not ask for because it is exactly what I needed. He went on, and talking about the game, he says, you know what? Yeah, that, that, that can help a team self-destruct. But he, here's the thing. He said, the biggest issue for Oregon is that they were not doing the basics and the fundamentals like Ohio State. Ohio State was focused on the basics and fundamentals. And he went on and he said, you know what? Here's the even greater thing. Between the offensive line and defensive line of Ohio State, they were able to overcome their fumbles, their dropping the ball, their turnovers, because they kept with the basics, kept with the fundamentals. They had this drive about them. They were not distracted by anything. I'm thinking, man, that ain't what I asked for, but that's what I needed. And then he went on and he, he wrapped it all up in an even better package. And he, this, I got to say this as a quote. He said, the biggest thing I saw out of Ohio State was their hunger and true desire to win at all cost. Did you hear that? He said, the biggest thing that I saw was their hunger and their desire to win at all cost. Final statement right here. You could tell they truly loved one another. Are you seeing the relationship? If you don't like football, that's fine. But, but do you hear that? Yeah, we dropped the ball. Yeah. He said, but on top of that, they, they, they kept to the basics and the fundamentals. And, and on top of all of that, they, they had this hunger and this desire to win at all costs. And at the end of the game, you could tell they truly loved one another. And so as I'm thinking with the church and our intention to drop the ball, once we get people in here and we, we begin to connect and, and we get them in, and then they just, they left thinking, what's next? The tension for us is we drop the ball and helping them and helping ourselves and helping others go deeper. We have the door wide open, but they're left thinking, what's next? And so if this is our tension, we, we can have this excitement, we can have this enthusiasm, and people come into the door and they think, what's next? If we're a church that desires to be focused, we're going to have to go deeper. And going deeper in our faith requires decision, commitment, and no excuses. Decision, commitment, and no excuses. And so I wonder, what would it look like for us? What, what if we had the hunger and the desire to achieve the goal of disciple-making at all cost? Because that, that's our win. That's what the church is called to do by Jesus Christ, is to go and make disciples. And what if we had this, this, this rich hunger and, and desire to make disciples at all costs? It doesn't matter. And then at the end of the day, people look at us, Grace United Methodist Church, and say, I can tell they love one another. I can tell it. We go deep. And going deep requires our decision, our commitment, and no excuses. If you will, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2. We're, we're going to check out a scenario in the early church. Acts is, is, is a is a great book that defines and describes for us the beginning stages of the church coming into being. We're going to begin in verse 37. And, and the, what we're going to read today, Peter is, is reminding the church the need to go deep in your faith. 
But if you don't go deep in your faith, you'll be left asking, what's next? So, we're going to pick up in verse 37, Acts chapter 2. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Let's stop right there. Now what have they heard? Peter had just given them a long sermon about the importance of turning to Jesus. He had reminded them of who Jesus was, that Jesus is the Son of God, and he had came to this earth, and it was you people who betrayed him and, and, and had him arrested, and he was crucified, but he did it for you, and he didn't stay dead. He was raised up. And so after hearing this, it says they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? It's the same question that sometimes folks maybe coming into the church ask. They come in, they get involved, they've been to worship a few times, and they think, what's next? Is this all there is? What's next? And so they look to Peter and they say, well, what should we do? And so Peter goes on, verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So, the, <clears throat> so those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Stop right there. So Peter had been preaching this message. The folks looked at Peter and said, Okay, what's next? And Peter says, well, here's what I want you to do. Here, here's, what's, here's what's next. You turn to God. You turn away from yourself. You repent. You, you, you believe in Jesus. You're baptized. And, and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, and, and that's what's next. And then Luke, the writer of Acts, goes on. And he tells us in verse 41. He says, about that day, th th there were about 3,000 people. And if we stop right here in the story... But there were about 3,000 people who came to Christ that day. If we stop right here in the story, we could be overly distracted by that number. That's a lot of people. Can you imagine that? And for some folks, they think 3,000 people in the world of mega churches and revivals and crusades really ain't that much. I mean, there's a church in a nearby city who boasts that every week. If we stop here in the story, we could be distracted by that number. We could be distracted away from the basics and fundamentals of the Christian life. If we stopped here, those 3,000 converts would most likely be thinking, okay, what's next? We, we, we've, we've repented, we've turned to Jesus, been baptized, Holy Spirit upon us, what's next? And so Peter I would imagine Peter reminded them, and Luke reminds us here in Acts. What's next? Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. It's almost like they were reminding the new converts, listen, guys, the excitement, the enthusiasm, it's all there, but there's more to it. You don't just stop there when you believe in Jesus and say, okay, I'm good, I'm going to heaven. You just don't stop there. There's more to it. There's four things you need to remember. The basics and fundamentals of the Christian life. You devote yourself in listening to the teaching. You devote yourself to fellowship. You devote yourself to the breaking of bread. Coming together, eating meals, or celebrating Holy Communion. You devote yourselves to prayer. That's going deeper. And then... Luke goes on in verse 43 through 47. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and all had, had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And what's happening in the story is that day by day, people are coming to know Jesus. And it's not some magical formula that, that the early church was doing. That they were just being and practicing the basics and the fundamentals. They were not dropping the ball. In light of all the excitement and enthusiasm, more people coming to know Jesus. They knew that we must go deeper. And going deeper 
requires our decision, our commitment, and no excuses. And for the early churches, it's the same then as it is now. We devote ourselves to the teaching. We devote ourselves to fellowship. We devote ourselves to the breaking of bread. And we devote ourselves to prayer. And Peter knew that this early church, this is what these guys needed. If not, they would be so distracted and wrapped up in the things that they would drop the ball. They needed to go deeper. And going deeper looks like devoting yourself to the teaching. Devoting yourself to fellowship. Devoting yourself to the breaking of bread. Devoting yourself to prayer. Or another way to say it is going deeper in faith requires our decision, our commitment, and no excuses. And again, this wasn't some magical formula for the church to just explode and grow. If anything, what what this created for the believers was an open door between them and God for God's Holy Spirit to be at work in the life of this early church. And I think that these four things about about, uh, devoting yourself to the teaching, devoting yourself to fellowship, devoting yourself to the breaking of bread, devoting yourself to prayer, I think these things are a reminder to us that all these thousands of people converted to Jesus and all these booms and numbers are not exactly what being a disciple is about. It's about going deeper. You can go there, but there's more to it than just saying, yes, I believe in Jesus. God calls us to go deeper. And in our going deeper, we will make more disciples. Going deeper in faith requires our decision, our commitment, and no excuses. So Grace United Methodist Church, if we're going to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, we must go deeper in our faith. And there's a truth and a principle that speaks to this, and this is this quote. This is profound if you want to write it down. Direction, not intention, determines destination. Direction, not intention, determines destination destination just knowing that does not make the difference but doing does the decisions you make will determine the direction and destination of your life direction not intention determines destination and you're thinking what does all that mean the destination for the church the destination for us is to make disciples we can have all the best intentions in the world when it comes to make disciples but if we don't go about the direction we need we'll never reach our destination And you heard read from Philippians chapter 2 this morning from the words of the Apostle Paul when he wrote to the church and he reminded them to work out your own salvation. And what that looks like is devoting yourself to the teaching, devoting yourself to fellowship, devoting yourself to the breaking of bread, devoting yourself to prayer. It takes you deeper. And going deeper in faith requires our decision, our commitment, and no excuses. So today really is like a part two to last week. That part of the church's responsibility is having an open door for all people, not setting up rules and regulations to say you've got to do A, B, C, and D and all the way to Z before you can come in. It's having the door open and letting Jesus do the transforming work in people's lives. And the part two is that once people come into the church, if we're not careful, we will drop the ball and they will be asking what's next. I'm here. I'm, I'm excited. This is a great place to be. I'm here every Sunday. But what's next? Talk about excitement and enthusiasm. Some of you can see this, but some of you cannot. These are working notes from last week's committee setup meeting. If you were a part of a committee in the church and you were here last week, we had lunch and we had a a great, great meeting. In fact, I would suggest that everyone who was here and they left after the meeting, they were fired up. I've heard from several of you. Man, we're pumped. And this is what the meeting was about. All the working committees were given some questions. For every specific committee, you were asked, what do you want to see one thing happen in your working committee? Like for church council or finance or whatever. What's one thing you want to see happen this this year, 2015? Then the next question was, throughout the whole church, not just to your specific committee, but for the whole church, what are some things you want to see happen this year? in three years, in five years, and in ten years. What what are some things you want to see happen? And here are the notes. And and every committee was separate, working on their own. They had not had prior conversation to say, what are you going to write down? You know, like you do sometimes in school, students, what do you write down? They didn't do that. 
And so what, what that means for us, the church, is that the Holy Spirit is at work in the answers that people brought, that each working committee brought. In fact, I've got them labeled like church council, staff, parish, relations committee, in his steps, outreach, finance. I've got them all labeled. And you see the, uh, all the writing is in the purple color. And if you can see, if your eyes are good, you can see a little green star. The green stars are the similarities. You want to know what the similarities are? Good. One thing that we wanted to see happen this year was the pavilion prayer garden that conversation that's been going on. We want to see that come to completion. We're closer than you could imagine. You know why? Because out of the round number that it would cost to, uh, to get this thing going was like 60000 and some change. We had an anonymous donation of $35,000. And the prayer from the beginning, from the building committee, was, God, if you want us to do this thing, you've got to get the money in. So I'm thinking that God wants us to do this thing. In addition to what's already been earmarked, the 16 to 17, we're almost at the 60,000 mark. And the building committee is meeting February 1st to get this ball rolling. Check. We're going deeper. Some other things. In the next three years, we want to see a Salkahatchee in Abbeville. In the next three years, I mean, it don't have to be three years. It can happen before then. We just say in the next three years. We want to see a soup kitchen in Abbeville to feed the hungry every day. And we want grace to be the driving force behind it. We want to see a homeless shelter for those who have no home, especially during inclement weather. And Grace wants to be the driving force behind it. Let's see. Yep. That's it. Those are the common threads. If that's who we are going to be, if that's where the Holy Spirit's pointing us, we've got to go deeper. If this is what we're going to do, we've got to go deeper. And going deeper in faith requires our decision, commitment, and no excuses. And every one of these things that we've talked about that we want to see happen in the next few years are all about others and not about self. I think that's awesome. Because it's a church looking outward and saying there are needs around us. And God has called us to meet those needs. So what? So what? If we're not careful... We'll be so wrapped up into the enthusiasm and the excitement that we'll drop the ball in fulfilling what we believe God has called us to. And there may be times that we will drop the ball. Just like Ohio State did over and over and over and over and over. And if you watch that game, you know they beat the teeth in to the Oregon Ducks. You know why? Because they practiced the basics and the fundamentals. You know why? Because they had a hunger and a desire to win at all costs. You know why? Because at the end of the game, you could tell they loved each other. And maybe again, you're thinking, so what? For us, our desire is to make disciples. For us, we believe that we can make disciples by looking out into the needs of others instead of just the needs of grace. And we can help those who are hurting. We can help those who need help. We can provide a place to worship. We can provide a, a, a warm and safe and dry place for folks to come who have no home. We can provide food for hungry bellies. But we know what? If we're going to do that, then we've got to have the hunger and the desire to do it. And to do it at all costs. And it's going to require us to go deep. Not just surface level in our faith, but to go deeper in our faith. And the book of Acts reminds us, you devote yourself to these things. You devote yourself in fellowship. You devote yourself to the teachings. You devote yourself to communion. You devote yourself to prayer. Those are the basics and the fundamentals that the church has. And do we have the hunger and the desire to make disciples at all costs? And at the end of the day, are people looking at us and saying, you can tell they love one another. Not just because they sing bind us together at the end, but you can tell they love one another because of how they live. Here's another challenge for you. For us to go deeper. Some folks have been coming to this church for a while. And they come in here every Sunday morning. 
And that's it. And I wonder if they ever think, what's next? And I wonder how many of us from the pulpit all the way back have looked to the folks that we sit beside or speak to or walk by every Sunday and we've never invited them to go deeper. We've never invited them to a Bible study. We've never invited them to a Sunday school class. We've never invited them to eat on a Wednesday night. What would happen if we, the church, took the initiative to go deeper? And in our going deeper, we invited someone else to go deeper with us. It's going to take decision, commitment, and no excuses. And are we willing to do it? Do we have the hunger and the desire to win at all costs? And can people tell that we truly love one another? It all comes back to the basics and the fundamentals. Devote yourself to the teaching of the scriptures. Devote yourself to fellowship. Devote yourself to the breaking of the bread. Devote yourself to prayer. Those are the basics and the fundamentals that will help us have the hunger and the desire to win at all costs, to truly love one another. But it requires our decision, our commitment, and no excuses. So today, what's your next step? What will it look like in your life to go deeper in your faith? What decision will you have to make today? What commitment will you have to make today? And for heaven's sake, let's quit making excuses. Let's pray. Gracious God, every one of us in our life has a need to go deeper in our faith. God, whether it's a first-time step into faith with you or whether we've been following you for a long time, but God, we need to go deeper. And God, you've called us, your church, to do some amazing things, to reach out into the community, to provide help and hope for those who are hurting. But God, we've got to go deeper in our faith in following you to make disciples. Lord, help us to have the hunger and the desire to make disciples at all costs. And may people look at us, Grace United Methodist Church, and say, man, they're, they're, they're people, and they have problems like everybody else. But I'll tell you one thing, you can tell they love one another. And God, because of, of, of these basics and fundamentals of the early church, that's what helped it grow. People looked to the early church and practicing these basics and fundamentals. And they wanted what the church has. Lord, help us to live in such a way that people look to us and say, I want what they have. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And if you could please stand. Um, this song is, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And it's an older song. And, but the words are perfect, especially for our commitment that we need to make. And the one that we need to be following is Jesus. And that's a decision that we have to make.
That was beautiful. So what's next, Grace? Are we going to go deeper? The decision is ours. And going deeper requires our decision, our commitment, and our no excuses. As we go today, let us go in the basics and the fundamentals with a hunger and the desire to make disciples at all costs. May we truly love one another through the grace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And please join hands as we sing Bind Us Together. <laughs>